I'm Michael Bain and welcome to Triggered, coming to you as always from the secret hidden bunker in the Rocky Mountains and Dragon House Studios. And first off, let me say that I really love this rifle. This is a Ruger SFAR, small frame auto-loading rifle. It's in 308 7.62 NATO. It is the size and feel of an AR-15, a regular 5.56 AR-15, but in the heavier caliber 308. It is not an AR-10. AR-10 implies parts interchangeabilities. This has a lot of proprietary parts in it, but the design parameter was roughly AR-15 size and a price that most people can afford, around $1,200, $1,220, something like that, although I've already seen it for a little less. And the reason I love this rifle is I just started shooting it. I like 308s, I like AR-10s. I think as most of you know, I have a lot of experience in them. Uh, just, in fact, did a class just a couple of three months ago with an AR-10 for long-range shooting out to 1,000, 1,200 yards. I've shot three-gun heavy metal with Colt 901, with the Galil 308. I like shooting AR-10 or 308 semi-auto rifles. This one is a sweetheart. First thing I noticed when I shot it, wow, this is the Ruger Boomer Break. It didn't recoil. I was shooting Hornady, um, Hornady Black 168 grain, uh, a max ammunition, great ammunition. And you could run this exactly as you could run an AR. So obviously, you see the features here. It's Magpul furniture. Um, this is an aluminum rail, light rail. It has a four position adjustable glass box, gas block, so you can run it dirty or you can run it suppressed. Otherwise, you look at it and you go like, wow, it looks, feels, handles like an AR-15 question you're probably asking me now is, why? Well, let's look at the regular niches that you might use an AR-15 in. Home protection, something I use an AR platform gun in, although my three-gun Galil in 7.62 or 308 is my home protection rifle because more is better, especially if you live out in the country. For hunting, 308 is a good cartridge for anything that walks pretty much on the North American continent, with the exception of the big grizzlies, the big bears. So you have here a hunting rifle. Competition, three gun. When I was shooting three gun, I would have probably killed to have a gun this weight that handles like this gun does. Weight is 6.8 pounds, sub 7 pounds. To give you some kind of perspective, both the Colt and the Galil that I shot in 3-gun were over 9 pounds, 9.5 pounds with optics. And even the ultralight, say Wilson Combat, Wilson built an ultralight Ranger hunting rifle in 308. It's coming in at about 7.4 pounds, so almost half a pound, three quarters of a pound above. Regular AR-10, let's say Daniel Defense, about 8.3 pounds for a 16-incher. This guy comes with either with a 16.1 inch barrel or a 20 inch barrel. One of the things that really, really struck me and one of the reasons I really like this rifle is it's a great trigger. This is Ruger's Elite 452 trigger, which they sell as an aftermarket trigger for their ARs for 160 bucks. Two stage, four and a half pounds. It's rare for me to pick up an AR platform gun, shoot it, and not say, I'm going to change the trigger. So we're going to be doing a lot more with this gun, but let me say this is the small frame AR that I've been looking for. Ruger SFAR. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Triggered. And this gun right here, this lightweight commander length 1911 in 9 millimeter, is what we would call in the old days a humdinger. 
These two guns are from our regular sponsor, SDS Imports, made by Tesis in Turkey. And as I said, they are lightweight commander length guns. That is, they have an aluminum frame, four and a quarter inch barrel. The slide is forged. You can see that the nine millimeter is a gray Cerakoted frame. The 45 all in basic black. This is a really super little gun. I like the Ed Brown bobtail. You know, when that first came out, I thought, that's a stupid idea. Right up until the point that I put one on a gun, had it fitted to a gun, and thought, this isn't a bad idea at all. Makes the gun that much more concealable if you want to carry it. Another thing about this gun I like, super thing I like, out of the box trigger, four and a half pounds. You can't argue with a good four and a half pound trigger. Now one of the things we did with this gun, because these are series 70s guns, they don't have any like weird other things going on, is I sent it to CNH Precision and had the, the slide machined for roughly the Shield RMSC. This is an RMSC with sights like the uh, Sig Zero, uh, Holosun 407, 507K series. Most of those sights have, as you can see there, a rear sight as part of the dot, so you have a co-witnessing sight, and you end up with a really nice little carry package gun. And you're going like, well, Michael, you know, everybody knows these lighter guns are better, but let's talk about weight here. This is a 26.88 ounce gun. To put that in perspective, G19, 22 ounces, the new Smith & Wesson M20 with an aluminum frame on it, 30 ounces. The SIG 320, uh, 320 carry, 26 ounces. It's not out of the ballpark heavy. And it's the first 1911 that I've handled in a, in a good while that I thought, this would be a great gun to carry. It would be a great gun to carry. This gun has the added, the 9mm has the added benefit of Sean's ugly grips. They really are ugly, aren't they? Sean McSheedy, Cylinder and Slide, it does amazing grip work, and it really highlights this gun. Comes with two magazines, a nine rounder and a 10 rounder. And again, we've talked about, nobody ever says it's great to have less ammunition, but let me say that if you're carrying nine or 10 rounds of nine millimeter plus a spare magazine, I'm pretty sure that can get you home at night. So these two guns, I think, are a real step up. Uh, with the fixed sights, they're Novak style sights. Um, you've got a great beaver tail. I have little bitty girl hands, sometimes on a 1911 beaver tail with their, their grip safety. I'll miss it. I won't get it. That has not happened with these guns. So the other thing about these guns, $579 MSRP. It's pretty impressive. We'll be right back. This week's Triggered is brought to you by Arms Corps, Rock Island Armory. What's your passion? Taurus USA, always ready, always bring it. Stoger, everyday tough. SDS Imports and the Tesis PX9. Tesis means quality. Hunters HD Gold, they change so you don't have to. Welcome back to our Your Best Defense segment. This last weekend, I was in Texas at the U.S. Concealed Carry Association conference. And in talking to a lot of other instructors, other trainers, they specifically asked me if I would mind bullet pointing out some of my ideas. You know, we've talked about changes in the self-defense landscape. We've talked about changes in the aggressor and victim relationship. So I wanted to at least bullet point out those changes in the aggressor victim relationship. And you know, we've said for years that basically the aggressor interviews victims and chooses the victim based on that interview. Well, that has changed. And let me give you four quick reasons why that has changed. The first reason is racial animus. That is unfortunate, but it is true. And you can see it in the statistics. I saw some of the most recent statistics that have come out in the last month. And they clearly show that there is a racial animus working within the aggressor-victim relationship. 
A second bullet point would be randomness. Previously, if we go back to the Halsican days of the world before 2019, we talked about, in most cases, above 50%, the aggressor was known to the victim, the victim known to the aggressor. That is no longer the case. The vast majority of assaults right now are taking place at random, which makes it a lot harder to figure out how to defend yourself, and it certainly makes it a lot less likely that that case will ever be solved. A third point, and this is very important, is that previously we saw a single aggressor or maybe an aggressor working with a partner or two. That was the model. What we see now is larger groups. Multiple aggressors, two, three, four, five aggressors. That changes a lot of the dynamics. Like when we talk about de-escalation, de-escalation typically is based on the idea that we are de-escalating a situation by talking to the aggressor. Well, if you talk to an aggressor in a group, you're going to get what might be called a therapeutic beatdown. It's not going to go well for you. And the final element, and this is the hardest element to understand, is there is an entertainment value in violent crime. It's fun. And it's being done as an entertainment value. Those are four elements that have changed the relationship between the aggressor and the victim. They're things you need to take into account. So, I'm Michael Bain. This is Triggered. Where can you find us? Well, you can find us on michaelbain.tv. You can find us on YouTube. You can find us on Rumble. And sign up on Twitter for the M-B-A-N-E-A-C-P feed. We'll see you next week.